Well, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Books and Books, the Miami Book Fair, and Penguin Random House, I welcome you all to what I know will be a great respite, and we need a great respite, from all that's going on these days. Speaking of all that's going on these days, I first want to extend my concern and best wishes uh, to anyone out there and everyone along the Gulf Coast, particularly to all my bookselling friends throughout the South who are facing some tough times right now. I'd also like to give my sympathies to Jacob Blake and his family, as well as all of those in Kenosha and in communities everywhere that are doing lots of soul searching right now. As for this afternoon, I don't think I've ever had an easier task than to introduce two writers who really, really, really don't need an introduction. It's so perfect that they will be in conversation with each other today because they really do have so much in common. Both have been writing for close to 40 years. Both have a string of bestsellers, number one bestsellers, and books in print that probably, if you strung out, would reach the moon. Both are abidingly uh, decent and have an incredible interest in social justice for all and for doing the right thing. And their work reflects that. They use mystery, humor. One's humor is darker than the other. They both write for young people as well. And each of them explore this crazy peninsula that we live in. They both also write some compelling nonfiction on social issues all across the spectrum. And also, I have to say, from a personal, on a personal note, they are two of the most generous people to writers, readers, booksellers, and everyone who loves books and the world they live in. Today, we celebrate Carl's new one, Squeeze Me. Um, it's just what the doctor ordered for right now. I don't want to spoil it for anyone out there uh, who haven't read it yet. All I want to say is that it has everything Carl Hyacin, uh, everything a Carl Hyacin reader would want. Killer pythons, the winter White House and the circus that comes with it. Um, catharsis. That's what I felt when I read Squeeze Me, and I felt much better for it. And John, John Grisham, too, has a new one. Um, his most recent one is Camino Winds, uh, and it's the sequel to Camino Island. Uh, both take place in a fictional Florida town, and they both feature a bookseller, which is something that I love. And uh, I'm really thrilled to be able to tell you that John has a prequel that you'll be hearing about that comes out in October. It's a prequel to Time to Kill, which comes uh, and features once again and brings back Jack uh, Briggins uh, from A Time for Mercy. And I know that it will uh, continue that tradition that John has of writing some of the most compelling and powerful courtroom dramas that are out there. So without further ado, let me bring on John and Carl and welcome them to this afternoon's event. John, <laughs> Carl, hey. But listen, before I start, Carl, I wanna bring greetings from a mutual friend of all of ours, who um, there was a, you know, we're, we're celebrating Squeeze Me, but we're also celebrating something else very special this week. And this is from Dave Barry, the great Dave Barry who says, so don't get too nervous, Carl, you know, oh, how God. he says, I congratulate my friend Carl on his new book and on his engagement, which oh, is boy. what we're celebrating as well. Oh, I boy. only hope, and this is what he says, which I think is great. I only hope I can find an engagement present for him as thoughtful as the one he gave to me. Thank God it didn't hatch. That's true. You have to tell us something about that. Oh, my God. Anyway, uh, Carl, John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> I was, that one I wasn't expecting. Thank you. Um, so I gave Carl, him a reptile egg. It was, it, it, we don't need to go into it. It didn't hatch. It was a reptile egg, and he, they put it in the freezer they ruined the present but anyway it would have been fine pet if he would have let it happen carl you're getting married again 
I, this is, uh, it's kind of a new, yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to bring it up, but now that Dave has brought, he's open. No, the can we not, can we not? <laughs> All right, we won't. No, it's, look at, um, you know, uh, it's, a good, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. And, uh, and, uh, you know, why, why, why are you stuttering? No, because I, I wasn't expecting any of this and it's just, uh, I'm, I guess I'm a little caught off guard, but no, it's, I'm very excited. My kids are excited and that's all that matters. So anyway, it's going to be great. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be better. I promise. Okay. So, John, go ahead. Can I ask the first question? Yeah. Absolutely. So I saw that, um, that, goofy promotional photo of you with the python yes and, yes and sir and i caught myself wishing the thing would just kind of you know squeeze when it was around your neck um this is a serious question have have they uh made progress in eradicating the pythons in the everglades no and they've killed they've killed thousands of them and they're and they're uh, they're moving they've eaten their way through much of the ecosystem in the everglades unfortunately and these burmese pythons which are in the book they get huge and they've actually advanced out of the Everglades. And, and um, uh, the book takes place on the island of Palm Beach. And I, I don't know of any instances that they've gotten there yet, but I, I kind of uh, wrote this book for everyone who, who couldn't be there when it happened. Isn't there some type of a bounty on these things? That yes, there is. <laughs> there is a, uh, it's per foot. I don't, I haven't, I've been on a couple Python hunts, but I haven't caught any of them. Uh, there is a bounty per foot. The bigger they are, the more you get. Um, it's, uh, I think it's hard work. <laughs> and, uh, but they did, this started all in her, after Hurricane Andrew, uh, when Andrew, it's ironic, we're talking because there's a hurricane in your book and there's a Hurricane Laura now, but Andrew, when it came through South Florida, it destroyed some sort of reptile farms on the edge of the Everglades. And a lot of them had these baby pythons that they were selling for pets and it dispersed them. And now, it, now they're all over the place. Just about four days ago, I think down in Miami or somewhere, a woman opened her washing machine and there was a big one in the washing machine. So that part of it is not, is not made up. I was just taking, you know, maybe fantasizing a little bit about who, where they would end up. Who hunts pythons? Who are these people? Um, they're a, a rugged group, John. They're, <laughs> they're, uh, they hunt them in, in air, you know, in airboats and on foot. And some, some of them are hyptologists. Some of them are just bounty hunters that sort of, like I did, grew up on the edge of the Everglades and sort of know their way around out there. And the big ones you hunt in group, usually one person can't handle a, a 16 foot snake. And as you saw the size of the one that was in the, the one that was, I had the picture taken with was in New York. It was in Elena Seabird studio. And I'd asked her to go find a Python and, in Midtown Manhattan, and she found it was, I think, a ten footer. And he, but he's a, he was a show business python. He'd been on the red carpet with supermodels. His name was Bumble. I'm not lying. He was a the, he was absolutely down with the whole photo shoot. But the wild ones are not, and they they bite and they can ask you know squeeze you in a, a in a fatal way. So the guys who do this and the women who do this um, are are tough. They know what they're doing, they, but it's 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 pretty hairy work. Do, do, do you have to, to get the bounty, do you, to get paid, do you have to kill them? Yes. You're, well, you can turn them into a state wildlife. But the, they euthanize them because they're an invasive species and they've killed off almost like all the marsh rabbits um, and the, even raccoons, possums. And these snakes will eat a full-grown alligator. And anything, by the way, that can eat a full-grown alligator is nothing you really want to run into. Uh, so there is a bounty on them and they, they euthanize them, yeah. And you said there are female python hunters. Uh, there, well, there, in the novel, there's the main character is sort of a wrangler like that. Yes, there are female python hunters. Yeah, nice yeah. girls, huh? Uh, you know, they they uh, they know what they're doing. You, you know, there's a whole system. I won't get into it. It'll creep out all the everyone who's tuned into this. But you you kind of have to jump them from a truck. You know, they, you see them and they're in, on headlight. You just either get them in headlights or you get, and then somebody has to take the head, the part that bites, and then others are assigned different parts depending on how big the animal is. And they kind of jump them and wrestle them around with them. So um, anybody that can grab a big one by the head and not, not get bitten, is they know what they're doing. They're pretty good at it. Carl, please tell me you're not engaged to a python hunter. No, I am not. No, I am not. She's a nice girl, huh? Yeah, she's a, yes, she's 
She's an IT, she's an IT analyst. So you, just the opposite of that. Yeah. You actually went out with the hunters to, to catch pythons. A couple times. Yeah. And I haven't, haven't had much luck. Um, uh, I mean, you might say I had, you would probably say I had great luck in not running into any, but I wanted to see it. I wanted to see it done. And then, then of course, one of my, one of my sons just, uh, just bought one, uh, not as a pet, not a Burmese, but a, another one. And, uh, on his own, and so now he's curating and 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 basically growing this python. So, but you know, it's my own fault because you know, growing up in South Florida, I, I as a kid, I always had pet snakes. I didn't have any exotics, but I had a lot of snakes, and it was always second nature to me. So writing about them was easy. I mean, it, it, some people get creeped out, but they're actually quite quite beautiful. If you say so. Uh, the question, uh, how, how far, we have a place in Amelia Island, which is north of Jacksonville. Right. That's our hangout down there. And I, 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 I sort of fictionalized Amelia Island to make it Camino Island. That's where the idea came from. But how far north have these things uh, sort of spread? Well, they've actually had some in Western Palm Beach County they, and they've had some, uh, they, I think they caught a couple in Martin County, which is even north of that. I mean, they're, they really are eating machines and they, they're very, very hard to find. You would think that a 16, 17 foot snake would be easy to see, but they're not. They, they are so camouflaged and they, they're just moving on up the state. So that was sort of the premise for this. What happened if they were, if they arrived in Palm Beach during the visit of uh, a fictional uh, president who has a, a mansion there? <laughs> I know it's it's a complete it's just a perverse fantasy, but that's kind of what we do for a living. <laughs> okay, Mitch, what we, Mitch, we we need a question not related to pythons, Mitch. Well, no, oh. no, it, it's an, it, it is sort of, but you know, Carl, the the thing that always strikes me about all your work is that that it takes the kind of loopiness of Florida and then you extend it. Um, with the world being as loopy as it is now, how, yeah, how did yeah. you modulate that? How were you able, were you fearful at all that, that events would become stranger than your work? I'm ter I was terrified the whole time I was writing. And John too, you're setting a book in Florida, but Florida has, has been a target rich environment for novelists, but it's getting, every day is getting weirder. And so when you're trying to write satire and stay kind of ahead of that curve and crank it up a notch, and the headlines, um, every day I held my breath that something wasn't going to happen in real life that would eclipse a, uh, a section of the book I'd written that I thought, well, this is really the sickest thing I've ever done. This will stand up at least for a few months. But you can't, I, I read about five or six Florida newspapers a day to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of, of, of all of, you know, all the depravity. Um, and it's, it, it's, you know, tropical depravity, but nonetheless. But, you know, it's, I think it's a challenge for any, anybody who writes humor, anybody who writes satire in this whole country right now. Um, I think it, it's really a challenge to stay ahead of real events and in a sad way, because, I mean, you know, you, Jerry Falwell Jr. and the pool boy, I mean, Come on, I, I, you know, I mean, how do you make, how do you, how do you improve that scenario with satire? You can't. It's as good as it gets right there. Well, for those of us from Miami Beach, even thinking of him at the Fountain Blue is hard to imagine. <laughs> oh, I can see him at the Fountain Blue. I yeah, can. No, I can. Now, now it makes perfect sense. But um, yeah, no, no, it's, it's really, it's really, really interesting along those lines. But, but John, do you find, how did you come, because you lived on Amelia Island, is that how you got to the Florida of it all? Because you're more from, uh, you know, Mississippi and you're yeah. living in... We've been in, we've been in Charlottesville for 26 years now. We moved here from Oxford, Mississippi, 26 years ago. That's home. Uh, that's where we went to school and grew up and, you know, that's, that will always be home. Um, and we, we moved to Charlottesville, uh, to kind of live for one year and hide, and uh, and we stayed. Uh, about that same period of time, though, we discovered uh, Amelia Island uh, just by accident. They built a new Ritz there, and my wife has some kinfolks in Florida, and we met there one weekend for a family reunion, 
and uh, uh, nobody got in a fight. There was no drama. We had a good time. And uh, we kept going back there for years and finally built a house about 10 years ago. We don't get down. We'd probably spend, you know, 30 nights a year on Amiga Island. And that's our hiding place now. We, we go there to, we're on the beach. The beach is secluded. Uh, it's a great place to quarantine. And uh, once each summer, we make the drive from Charlottesville to uh, Amelia. This is our summer uh, summer trip. We load up the, the dog and the, and the SUV and uh, with some good food and all that. And, and we listen to books on tape and podcasts and all. And we, we were making the drive about four years ago. And there was this great story on NPR about some stolen rare books. And it really, and I, I collect, uh, you know, 20th century first editions and have for a long time. So I, ha I have an interest in rare books. And, uh, but their thievery is uh, rampant in the rare book and rare manuscript world, primarily because libraries are not known to be that secure. And so there have been some real problems. This particular story, though, was about a, a collector who had some rare books stolen. Anyway, it's a good story. So my wife and I started talking about uh, how could you write a mystery or create a mystery um, centered around rare books, rare manuscripts. And so we kicked it around as we were driving and the story got better and better. And I spent the week down there uh, online reading fascinating uh, articles, news reports about the business and, and the thievery and stolen books. And that's how Camino uh, Island came about. And I, I made the, the hero, this guy who owns a, gorgeous bookstore. I took Square Books in Oxford, my favorite bookstore, and I put it uh, on in this fictional town in Florida. And the, the bookseller, uh, uh, Bruce Cable, is, uh, you know, he, he, he's very much uh, involved in publishing, and he, he makes a lot of money, like most booksellers, and he, he sleeps <laughs> with all the young ladies who come through on tour, like most booksellers. And anyway, so it, it became a lot of fun. And, and by the time I finished uh, the book, I knew I'd go back for more because I love the setting. I love the characters and the bookstore. And uh, so Camino Winds is, uh, takes place in the middle of a hurricane, but it's, it turns into a murder mystery. But uh, I'll probably go back. Uh, well, I have a contract to write one more uh, Camino book, and I'll probably do it in a couple of years. That's cool. And it, 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 it takes you a little bit away from, you know, the courtroom drama stuff yeah, that yeah. you write a lot about. And so, Carl, I know that you have a love for the environment. You grew up with it. Everything you write about is about that. You have your character Skink, who I'm happy makes an appearance here. Although that's a little bit of a spoiler alert because it happens a little later in the book. But um, what, how did this book come together? Was it more from the political point of view or were you thinking of it from the environmental point of view to begin well, I was thinking of both. I mean, I, I, you know, I still write the column for the, the Herald every week and, and you're trying to stay topical. So it's I'm never too far from what the headlines are. And just the climate of the times and things that were happening. And for me, it all becomes, I mean, I admit it's sort of a, 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 a psychological therapy for me. I mean, I do it, I don't mean this in a bad way, as much for myself as I do for the readers, because they're just, it, my brain starts filling up with, you know, it, this is a hard time to sort of be neutral and you can't be neutral with everything that's happening. But satire can be a pretty, effective weapon as, as well as being therapeutic. So, I mean, it all came together uh, just over the past, you know, year and a half or so, just, just the, the confluence of events. And I wanted to, I, I, I had, I dropped a python or two into some of the other novels, but it's become such a problem here that I felt for the environment that I felt, well, you know, why waste a perfectly good predator uh, and, and when you and when you, in a political scenario, which just seemed perfect, perfect for me. I do have to tell because John was talking about rare books. I have to tell a story that he doesn't even know about about himself. Many years ago, and John was already, uh, you know, a big deal. And I, I was someone sent on a book tour, and I went to to. Uh, we, we all have to sign books. Everybody, you know, you sign your book, and sometimes the signature is great, sometimes not. So I was sent to a bookstore in Blytheville, Arkansas, <laughs> which I suspect John remembers. And they, they booked it the same afternoon as Arkansas was playing Oklahoma, the football game, and also the state chili, the chili cook-off in the same venue. So needless, needless to say, the bookstore, there wasn't, it was, it was before social distancing, it was socially distanced. I was the only <laughs> Aside from the store owner and one person working there, I was the only person in the store. And I, 
you know, I was trying to stay upbeat. I signed whatever in stock they had, John. And then she said, you know, I, I'm, you, I, I have something special to show you. And she climbs up on the, in this area and she did, brings down a, a wooden folding chair and she puts it right in front of me and there's a signature on an auger. She said, you know who that is? And I said, John Grisham. She said, John Grisham was here and he signed that chair. And I said, well, and, she, and then this was the killer. She said, would you like to sign a chair? And, and since frankly, I wasn't signing anything else. <laughs> I said, hot damn, I'll sign one of those too. And so somewhere it, I suppose in a warehouse, is, is your chair has probably got better display than mine, but that was, his autograph was right there on it. That's a true story. That it's was pretty called, much uh, the highlight of Blytheville, Arkansas. Yeah. No offense, but to me, that particular trip for me. Yeah. That was Mary Gay Shipley. Uh, yes. She had, the, she had the bookstore in Blytheville for many years and so <laughs> a few years ago, and uh, I think it's still open, but barely. And uh, that's kind of my, that's why I was born close by there. And, and so. You remember the chair? Oh, well, we sign a chair every year. You have to sign a chair every year. So I've, I've probably got 15 chairs around there somewhere. Yeah, I love that. Mary Gay, Mary Gay was uh, a real force. Uh, oh, God, yeah. Like Mitch, you know, in, in, in book publishing, you've got, you know, you got a dozen, two dozen of these rock star booksellers who yep. it all happen, who are very involved with um, the Booksellers Association. They're plugged in with the publishers. They want the writers in their stores. They, they work, work, work. And uh, she was remarkable because, uh, you know, you can draw a crowd in Miami. It's hard to draw one in Blyville, Arkansas. Well, she, especially when Arkansas is playing Oklahoma that, that afternoon. That's a tough one. She should know better than that. I, I don't think, I don't think, honestly, I don't think it was her call. I think uh, it was programmed into some grueling tour I was on. And, and uh, she was, she's a terrific person. But, I mean, she felt so bad. And it wasn't her fault. I guess it was a hell of a football game um, because the place pretty much deserted. But, um, but uh, that's that's when I remember looking at it, the folding chair. I just okay. <laughs> you know, I tell stories about uh, I talk to young writers, and they don't believe that um, that you and I uh, ever went to bookstores for signings and nobody showed up. <laughs> and uh, it, it happened to all of us. Oh God! And uh, with the time to kill, uh, I went to uh, quite a few bookstores and almost nobody showed up. And it was really odd because when you, when you get to the bookstore, you're, ner you're a nervous wreck anyway. Is anybody going to show up? Because it's very embarrassing when they don't. <laughs> we've, all, we've all been through that, okay? The <laughs> and when you get there, the, they've got your little table with a stack of books. And the staff, the staff is great to see you. They're happy you're there. You're in the store. It's a big event. And everybody's kind of watching the, the clock on the wall until, you know, 4 o'clock, for a 4 o'clock signing. And, and once it gets to be 4 o'clock and there are no customers, then you start losing the staff. They, they finally get busy elsewhere, back in the back, the stock room. You know, so before you know it, you're sitting at the table all by yourself, no friends anywhere. Even the bookstore owner finds find something else to do because you know, it's obviously a dud. And so you sign a few books and you just sit there. You're hung out to dry for at least an hour. And every writer goes through that. Uh, I, had, I had a guy show up one, that, that had no customers that day. I was suffering through another books, uh, book signing with no books to sign. And this guy comes up and picks up my book. And uh, he was, I thought he was a customer. And uh, we talked, you know, he said, what's the book about? And, and I, you know, gave him my best spiel. And he was flipping through the pages and I realized he was actually reading the first chapter. <laughs> he got kind of quiet and I, you know, I rambled on and whatever. And, he, and then when he finished the first chapter, he slammed the book and gave it back to him and walked off and uh, didn't buy the book. And I thought, you son of a gun. After all, I sold zero books that day, which, you know, again, that happens to everybody. Well, as a bookseller, I can tell you, <laughs> you just I've just uh, had an amazing, I'm gonna have to go take a Valium or something. You just brought up every one of my worst fears. You know, you just ex expressed each one of them. So over 40 years, a lot of that has happened, but, What's been beautiful is to watch both of your careers develop. Because I, I feel like I was there pretty much at the beginning, knowing both of you for so many years. And it's just so wonderful when you find your readership. And, and that is what's so gratifying. And, and both of you have done that. Both of you have such loyal followings. It's kind of amazing. Um, but the other thing that I love is that neither of you kind of rest on your laurels. 
So both John and Carl have written for kids. So Carl's books, um, we know that he got started fairly early. John, how did you get started writing your kids' books? It was very simple. Uh, my daughter, at the time, this was about 10 years ago, was uh, her first year of teaching school in Raleigh, North Carolina. And over dinner one night, she was teaching fifth graders, she asked me if I could write suspense for kids. And I'd never thought about that before. And I started thinking about it and how, you know, how could you get kids hooked? She said that a lot of, you know, kids books, a lot, a lot of uh, different types of books, a lot of, uh, you know, mystery and historical fiction. And, and, and but she wanted to, she looked, she couldn't find good suspense. And so I, I, I gave it a shot and, and started the Theo Boone series that I've now had seven of those books. And uh, I try to do one every other year. And, uh, I really enjoy the series. They're, the books are easier to write, obviously. They're shorter, uh, fewer words, smaller words, smaller plots, not as many subplots because you're writing for 13-year-old kids. Uh, but I love Theo and, uh, and hope to write more of those. And Carl, by the way, my daughter, who was home two nights ago, uh, wanted me to be sure and tell you that uh, she loves your kids' books and her students do. They, they, they get into them big time. Yeah, that's, that's been the most rewarding thing, thing for me. I was kind of like you, John. I mean, I, uh, when I started, my stepson at the time and my, uh, and, and my nieces and nephews were all in that age group where I was terrified to give them one of my adult novels for, for obvious reasons. Obvious and, reasons. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and an editor just suggested, I never even dreamed of trying to do it, but I did you know, when I, and I wrote Hoot, and then, the, but the, the feedback, I, if will you, maybe you'll find the same thing. I find the feedback tremendously uplifting from young readers, A, that they're reading it all, right. and B, that they're sort of connecting with the themes, and, and not, it's not just the humor, but that they're plugged into it, and they, they get it, but it's a different kind of response than you get from adult readers. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's for some reason, when you get the letters from kids and they still, the, these, the teachers have them, you know, do the classroom. And, and so you get a bunch of, bunch, I still get bunches of letters, that, you know, all the time. And it's, I, I don't know, I found it oddly inspiring that I thought, okay, this is worth doing. Just when you think, you know, I, you yeah. know I'm done, then you, and it, it's so important to get everyone reading, but especially young people right now when you're competing against you know, the iPhone and the, the Xbox and everything else. To, the idea that they'd sit down with an actual book, that's, that's pretty cool. And then write you a letter. That's what's gratifying. Yeah, I mean, and, and the other thing, if you found this, John, they're pretty blunt critics, by the way. Well, they're horrible. They, yeah. uh, they, 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 this is what happened to me. The, the Theodore Boone is seven books now in a series. And so uh, it dates back over 10 years. And I can't remember what I put in book one or two or three. I can't remember all the details in a series. And so after about four books, I realized I was getting not just letters from kids, but dirty letters from kids who were finding mistakes. In my, I mean, obvious mistakes that I had I'd misplaced the name yeah. of a school or a street or a deli or whatever from, from book number two. And I got it wrong in book number five. These kids read the book so closely, they can't wait to catch me in a mistake and write me a letter about it. And I said, <laughs> okay, this has got to stop. <laughs> so I actually hired a summer intern a couple of years ago to read the first five or six books and give me a, like an anthology or bibliography of, of all the, I had to cross check all the names to stop all the mistakes because they're there. But the, the kids were unloading on me big time. Yeah, I love it when they'll, they'll start and they'll say, we really like your book. The whole class loved it. And then about the fourth paragraph, it's like, you know, the one thing is, I think you could have done more with this character. <laughs> and they'll go into whole character, to like one character where I was a fellow little short. It's funny as hell, but it's, it's fantastic. I got a letter from a federal judge in California who had a classroom come to court. And they watched the trial and they were very well behaved. I think they were probably 12 or 13 years old. And during recess, he invited the kids uh, back to his chambers. And he met them, you know, he had his robe on and the kids were very impressed. And they started uh, asking questions. And, and the judge was just uh, taken with how much they knew. And I mean, they knew procedure and, and, and the, 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 the participants in the courtroom and what, what the clerk did, knew all this stuff. And he asked the teacher and she said, well, they, they read four of the Theodore Boone uh, books by Grisham and they, they're learning some of the law. 
And I thought, I almost stopped writing at that point. I said, good God, these kids are thinking they know what I'm talking about. But the, but the letter the letter was from the judge, and he was very complimentary. He said, these, That's so kids, cool. these kids are learning about the law. And so I, so I'm, I'm still writing them. Well, you know, I know that there's a lot of schools that we work with that teach Carl's books in their science classes, actually, in middle school. You know, like some of the books they, you know, when they're introducing environmental stuff and that sort of thing. So we're going to go to Q&A. But Carl, I want to start by asking you something which just, you know, it's going throughout the entire novel. How much time, it must be a huge amount of time you spend on coming up with the names for people. How do you I, do I, that? I do. I, I, I spend a lot of time on the names. And sometimes if, if I don't get the name right, it actually affects the writing where I'm, I'm into a character enough and it's just not happening. I realize I've got the wrong name. And I mean, I'll, I'll change the names a couple times. Like Kiki Pew, Fitzsimmons. Well, that's like right out of the Palm Beach Shiny Sheep. They all have to have three names. The, yeah. the, the, the Palm Beach Socialites. It's a, there's a law. You can't, you can't go out unless you've got three names. <laughs> um, but like, for instance, the, the name of, uh, you know, the name of the presidential uh, retreat is, is, is Casa Bella Cosa. Right. And I, I had that from the beginning. I didn't have to fool around with that. But some of the other, you know, some of the other things, it just, I don't know about, maybe John feels the same. Sometimes on the page, it just doesn't look right. It doesn't look like they should have that name. And I, I, I monkey around with those pretty far into the manuscript. Well, and, and, you know, you also, I love the names you gave. What is it? Mastodon you gave? Oh, the Secret Service name. Yeah. Secret Service name. Yeah, I, I read up about it. I don't know what the current occupant of the White House, his, his uh, real secret for his name. But I read up on how they come up with these. And so in the book, the, pre the president is Mastodon and the first lady is Mockingbird. Um, but they do, I think the, the Secret Service has somebody on the payroll just to come up with, you know, appropriate names that, that they don't, that not necessarily the, the ones who have the names actually get, you know, they don't really get it. Also, but, uh, did you know that you were going to bring Skink back from the beginning? Was that something yeah. that you were going to have him in there being the kind of... Well, you know, he's, he's a hermit. He's been living in the, in the middle of the... You know, he's always out there in the middle of nowhere. And, and, and I think I had... Once the... You know, once that you make the commitment to Pythons, I pretty much had to bring him back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have a lot of characters that can... Uh, past characters that can can deal with pythons. I love the fact he's lived a very long and fruitful life, Skink. So and he hasn't mellowed one bit, which is not at all. About him. Not at all. Yeah, no, no. And he still has uh, Mr. Tile with him, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Here, a, a question from one of the listeners. Uh, have you heard from any of the Palm Beachers or Trump supporters about your, uh, <laughs> your, your, your accurate portrayal of all of this? I know it's a little early. You might as it goes, but uh, no, but it, it's early yet, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm. Here's the thing: I was asked about that. I'm used to I, the the column I've written for all these years for the Herald. Anyone who's who's read the column knows that I don't. I don't. You know, I mean, I you get strong feedback if you write a newspaper column in this day and age. Or anything. So, I'm I'm used to it. It doesn't bother me, uh, and I hope you know. I hope everybody gets a laugh, but if they don't, you know, move on. I always tell people, you know, if it's really going to upset you that much, you know, you get letters from people, I'm never going to read your column again. I'm never I'm going to cancel. The, and, I, and I always say to them, if it's going to upset you that much, you know, read something else. I don't want your blood pressure going up. I don't want you to have some sort of, you know, colitis or anything because of me. Just pick up somebody else to read, you know, move on. <laughs> and John, how about you? I mean, you've written on a more serious vein, on some very, very serious topics. Have there been people who've kind of held your feet to the fire for one reason or another, or not been happy with you for what you've done? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I don't tell them, don't buy the book. I tell them, buy the book, just don't read it. But <laughs> always, always buy the book. Uh, That's much smarter. <laughs> yeah, or, or buy a couple of copies and give one to somebody. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you have to be careful in popular fiction. You can't assume that your readers share your politics. And if you read my books, you know, you know what my politics are. I'm not going to change. But um, my wife says occasionally, get off the soapbox and stop the preaching and just write a good old fashioned legal thriller and, and don't alienate people. But in, in, in this, you know, in this, in this environment, uh, people are so easily um, 
pissed off and and so yeah i mean i get i get some feedback that's not good i don't care i mean i i don't know carl do you read do you read all the letters you get no i couldn't i i don't know yeah, and you're yeah, like yeah. How, how would you have time to write or be productive as a writer if you went through all all this stuff you can't do it you can't let it get in your way and yeah. and it it really i do know writers john that kind of a, obsess over it and i've always i i don't know how they work if they're reading every comment online, first of all, I don't even know how you find those comments. Secondly, like I have a I have a, a Twitter account that the Miami Herald sort of required all of us to get. And I'm supposed to post a couple of times a week, but who has the time to go through and look at what everybody commented on your latest? Who besides maybe the president has time to go through and, and look? I mean, we're writers, so you can't sit there. And, uh, you can't worry about that stuff. It'll just get in the way of the craft. Well, Stephen King does, but he's, you know, he's, he's a different uh, animal. He, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, I think he lives on Twitter and he's always starting fights. And I mean, I admire the guy. He's really, he pops off all the time. He's really uh, down on the president and Republicans. And, you know, he, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure just because you have a platform doesn't mean you should use it all the time. I, I you know, no. I, 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 I use mine through, uh, through the stories and, and you know, I've written about environmental destruction. I've written about the death penalty, wrongful convictions, all a lot of issues I deal with. Uh, the book, the book um, Time for Mercy, coming out October 13th, by the way, Mitch, and soon in bookstores everywhere. Um, it's, about, it's about the issue is, uh, do you put teenage kids on trial for capital murder or, or murder? I mean, or do, do you sentence kids to prison for, for life, which is basically a death sentence? And so it explores, those are pretty tough issues to write about. And, and they, they do provoke some strong reaction from, from people who disagree. But at the same time, you can't worry about everybody. You can't, you know, I don't, I don't read, every, I can't read every letter. Uh, it's, it's gratifying to get, you know, a box of letters from New York where they all go and they, they, they send them here and, you know, there are hundreds of letters and from all over the country. And that's gratifying, but I, I don't have the time to read them. Somebody, sure. you know, somebody does read all of them. Uh, because we, um, you know, we just want to know what, I don't hear the reports, but if there's something, if there's a threat, I get a lot of letters from prison. Uh, I do too. I do too. <laughs> do you open them? Uh, no, but somebody <laughs> else does. And, and uh, you know, you want to know if there's a crackpot out there who's, uh, you know, making threats, you, you kind of want to know that. So yeah, we, yeah, we read the mail and uh, occasionally I'll, uh, I'll respond to, to someone if it's a really nice letter. I'm not going to fight with people, you know, to the mail or anywhere else. It's life's too short. Life's just, I got another book to write. Yeah. I'm this, I'm the same way. I mean, I, I read when it, if somebody takes the time to put a stamp on something and send it to me, it, it's going to get read either by me or, you know, somebody. And I try to respond to every, everyone that I can. I, I, because of the newspaper column too, I get a fair amount of prison mail. And, and when I was young, I, I tried to write back to everybody. So I, Here's what I found. If you write back to someone in prison, even if you're not interested in the 88 pages they sent you about why they shouldn't be in prison, then you get a letter from everybody on the cell block <laughs> who says, because they share it and they say, hey, this guy, he's a, he'll, he'll write about you. And then you're, then you're swamped with, with prison mail. So now I, 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 I just can't respond to it. I don't. I wrote a book. Uh, I've written one nonfiction book, The Innocent Man, about wrongful convictions and came out about oh 15 God, years man. ago. And, uh, and it really um, inspired a lot, of, a lot of people who are in prison who think they're innocent uh, would like me to write their stories. And so I got, I got deluged after that, but that kind of went away. I get a lot of letters from lawyers in prison, believe it or not. Uh, every, <laughs> every lawyer in prison writes me a letter. And I, honestly, the stories are pretty great. Uh, but I, I have this fear of... Um, I have this fear of, of reading something really compelling. Um, and then, you know, five years later, in the middle of a subplot in a book I'm writing, I might use something like that. Yeah, then I, I, I had the same. Then, then I get sued. You know, then the, law, the lawyers are, you know, they'll, they'll hire a lawyer and write some dirty letters and sometimes they actually file suit. So I, I, I have an official policy now of not reading anything that comes from prison uh, because, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to get sued again. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, question that came in from uh, an audience member. Do either of you have one character that is your favorite character in all of your work? Mm. 
Yeah. Um, the time to kill was uh, pretty autobiographical because when I started writing that book in 1985, I had no idea what I was doing. I was a small town lawyer in Mississippi struggling and dreaming of the big case, you know, and dreaming of somehow uh, being in the courtroom for the big verdict. And I was sort of living that life at the time. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, autobiography in that character, Jake Brigance. And I brought him back uh, seven years later, a book called Sycamore Row, and really uh, enjoyed revisiting Jake and his friends in this fictional town in Mississippi. And then uh, this, this summer, I finished the book, A Time for Mercy, which is a sequel to A Time to Kill. It comes out in October. And so I just spent most of the past year with Jake and, and the same characters. And I really, that's where my heart is. I, I wish I could write all my books and set them in Ford County, Mississippi. Uh, I can't do that uh, for a bunch of reasons, but it's, it's awfully nice to go back and revisit those people. It's going to be a great fall. We have Squeeze Me and we're going to have your new one too, John. Very excited about that. Um, another question that somebody has, this is a more technical question, Carl. Is it possible that there could be any pythons in Mar-a-Lago? Is that quite possible? Oh yeah, they, they're good swim. Absolutely, pythons. That's the that's the scary thing about Squeeze Me and most of the novels. It, it, there's nothing in it in it that couldn't really happen. I mean, it's uh, those are, they're great swimmers. They've 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 left the Everglades. They've gone a long way from the Everglades. There's no reason why one of them couldn't swim across the intercoastal waterway. Um, that's what they do, and. Uh, so, you know, again, I, I didn't put anything in there that couldn't really happen. And that, in, not just the political stuff, but, but all the stuff relating to what was happening in the Everglades, what was happening with these, these giant animals was all true and based on, I didn't make up anything there. No, it could happen. And I, you know, whether they would, whether they would climb the wall at Mar-a-Lago, I don't, I don't know. You know, we can, you know, again, that's one of the, one of the, this is one of the selfish things about writing novels is that you, you get to make things happen that you've if you've thought about or that, that have occurred to you or that would be entertaining in some way. And I do find entertainment value uh, in that particular thought. So, you know, it's just, and it's your characters. Like John mentioned, you know, you, you do become attached to certain characters. That's why I brought this, the ex-governor back, Skink. I mean, he's not in all the novels, but every time he's on the page, and he's doing something, I probably feel closer to that character because he's, always, he's usually getting away with something that I wish I, I could get away with. Is there one of the books that you like that character? Which one of your books, if you do have one, does Skink, um, are we most attracted to Skink? In which one of your books might it be? You know, I can't. It, I happen to like him in all of them personally, but yeah, I mean, I, I did a book uh, called Star Island, uh, where the, mm -hmm. where I decided that uh, that that maybe uh, South Beach, Miami, would be a good place to turn him loose for a mm -hmm. while. And again, that was just me, this sick fantasy. Though that would, I thought that would be fun. Put him in that scene. You know, I, I don't know. It's like looking back on your kids. And saying, you know, which which child you like the best, or what? When did you did you like? You know, did you like him better when he was a teenager? Do you like him better as a grown up? You know, it, it's really hard. it's hard. It's hard for me. As, to be we're, as we're talking about skink, someone writes, um, uh, "Why can't we have him run for governor again?" <laughs> oh my God! I get they're bumper stickers that people have printed up for him running. I, I get sent. They're very, it's very cool. I don't know. I don't. I don't think he's like me. He's really not psychologically suited for public office. No. You know, there's a, there's a couple of obviously some, some Miamians writing and there's a question from somebody saying, do you have any early memories of Biscayne Bay? And oh yeah. Is, and is there anything, any one kind of um, uh, advancement we can do to help save the Bay in any real way? No, I mean, when you, it, the population has gotten so huge. I mean, I remember when people actually lived in Stiltsville I lived on those stilt houses uh, full time. And we, I, we were out there in a 12 foot aluminum boat with like a eight horsepower engine on it, puttering around. And now you, you die, you'd be run over by a, a speedboat or a 
you know, a yacht within five minutes of that. So you, you, everybody can look back at, I think, places that they loved and they were special to them in their childhood. And I'm sure John, John can, they've all changed. And I, how do you cling to them? And how do you make sure that there, there's going to be a little of that left for your kids and your grandkids? And that's, that's the eternal question. You can, you can write about it and you can, even in a column, occasionally get up on a soapbox. But in the end, the, the whole community has got to come together and say, this is worth saving. This is not just for me, it's for the, the future. John, any thoughts about that yourself in terms of the environment, where we are? No, I have another question about pythons. Oh, um, Jesus Christ. I asked you this earlier. I think you dodged the answer. Um, the, the battle to eradicate these, these snakes is not going well? No. The snakes are winning? Well, they're so prolific. They're catching a lot of them, but they, uh, w one female python can lay uh, 90 eggs. And there's very, they have very few natural enemies. So they're reproducing at a much, uh, and it's one of the few snakes, and this is something, a piece of trivia nobody needs to know, but it's one of the few uh, big constrictors that actually guard their eggs. Most snakes lay their eggs and move on. Python, female python will actually guard the eggs. And so their survival rate of those, of those snakes is much higher than it would be for many species. So they just reproduce at a phenomenal rate and you can't keep up. They've caught tons and tons of them, um, but it, they can't keep up with the, the, the rate of, that they're reproducing. They, and they have these, oh, this is so gross. The females, they put in transponders, John, in the females, because the females attract not just one male, but they attract many, and they get in this, they call it a mating ball. Again, this is, we're getting into Jerry Falwell country, but there, <laughs> where there's about, there's a whole bunch of snakes in a ball uh, getting it on. And so they, if they can track the female and on a transponder and they get there at the right time, then they, not, they don't just catch the female, they catch all the horny male pythons. I, I have not witnessed any of this, but I've heard firsthand what it's like. Uh, but that's what they're, that's the de level of desperation. They even train beagles, to tra they train a couple of beagle to try to, <laughs> follow, to follow these, hasn't worked out that great. And by the way, you don't want to let the beagle off the leash if you're in that, in that, but that's, everybody's desperate to try to figure out how to stop these, these damn things. Is there a YouTube video of, of the ball? Of the, of the I imagine, I imagine there is. Uh, it, they're probably, it's probably on Tinder too. Uh, um, I, I don't know. I have not gone to that. There, there is video of one eating uh, an alligator and there's video of pyth alligators eating pythons. Um, these are things that I don't, you know, recommend for family viewing necessarily, but it's all out there. Somebody just wrote, uh, one, of the, one of the folks watching said, my New Year's resolution was to lose 20 pounds and read 30 books. I have gained 30 pounds and have read 42 books. Many thanks to both of your authors for supplying my entertainment during the pandemic. So I think that's what most people have been doing, eating and reading. It yeah. seems to be what it is. I also can't tell you how much I enjoyed this afternoon. You guys, you guys are amazing. It's, um, it's John Grisham. Uh, Jake Briggins is back with his new book, uh, which will be coming out in October, right? Uh, a Time for Mercy. October 13th. October 13th. There you go. We know it. You can buy it. You can pre-order it at booksandbooks.com or your local indie bookstore. And we also have Squeeze Me, which we're celebrating this week along with Carl's engagement, but we're celebrating Squeeze Me, which do yourself a favor, run out, buy it here, buy it anywhere. If you buy it from us, we have signed copies of both John's books and Carl's book. Not so initial, book. not initial, full signature. Not full signature, there it's a big page that <laughs> signed on. Anyway, guys, I can't, let's do this again sometime, but let's do it in the real world. Let's have a cup of coffee afterwards or Go to Joe Stone Crab or do something. All right. Lots of security, though. Lots of security, please. <laughs> My pleasure. Let's go to Joe's Stone Crab. I can't wait to go. All See you right. Now. Thanks, John. Thank you, man. Thank Matt. you so yeah. much. It was a Thanks, great Mitch. Day. Thank you all for watching. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Yeah. Random House. Thank you, Miami Book Fair. And thank you all.